Hi everyone, it's MJ and welcome to the Actuarial Podcast, where in today's episode we're going to be talking about Africa's demographics. Now I am hoping that everyone listening here understands that Africa is a continent and that it is not a country, like we see sometimes in some of those movies. Um, But just some quick stats about Africa, I mean the total size of it is 30 million square kilometers. So that is huge. Uh, Total population is 1.3 billion and total GDP is 2.2 trillion dollars. So Africa, it is it's quite a big deal. And I want to look at Africa's demography. Now, demography is an actuarial subject. Um, It's basically the statistics behind human populations. Um, Now, there must just be a little bit of a disclaimer, and that is that stats can be abused, they can be distorted, they can be wrong, they can be outdated. So the sources that I'm going to be using today come from, you know, mainly the internet, uh, Wikipedia, Economist magazine. Um, And I mean, these stats that I'm going to be quoting, they could be wrong, they could be deliberately wrong, they could be genuinely trying to be right, but they just collected the data wrong. Um, So we must always take these these numbers with a grain of salt. Um, Also, just another heads up, we are going to be talking about some mature topics. So yeah, if you if you get, you know, we're gonna be talking about death and some other scary stuff. So if you're not wanting to hear that, please don't continue listening. But we are gonna start on on a happy note, and that is yeah, let's let's talk about some cute little babies. Uh, specifically, I want to look at birth rates. You know what what do we mean by birth rates? Uh birth rate is the total number of births per one thousand people in a population in a given year. Um so yeah, birth rates grow a population, whereas your mortality and migration rates reduce a population. Now, estimates are saying that the world's average birth rate is around 18.6. Um, and what that means is that four babies are being born every second. So every second, bam, four more babies have just entered this world. Now, this is quite incredible because this number has halved since 1950. Now, very low birth rates are seen as a negative by by certain governments like Italy and Malaysia. Uh, Their belief is that, you know, we're not going to have enough workers in the future to support an aging population, Uh, whereas very high birth rates are also seen as a negative by governments like China and India. They stress that, you know, that... um, a big population will put a strain on the welfare system, uh, might cause unemployment and have a bad environmental impact. Um, now, to increase birth rates, governments can introduce these things known as pro-natalist policies like financial incentives or support services to new mothers. To decrease birth rates, governments can introduce anti-natalist policies such as information and access to birth control. Or they can do some really messed up things, um, such as mass sterilization that we saw in India, or forced one-child policies that, thankfully, China is starting to to relax on. But yeah, there were some terrible, terrible consequences uh, that happened with that mass sterilization and the forcing of only one child. Distorted the gender uh, demographics, and it was yeah, it's just a mess. It's just a mess. Um, High birth rates are associated, though, with low women rights, low living standards, and low education levels. Um, But speaking about low, let's look at the 10 countries with the lowest birth rates. And of course, we've got Vatican City with zero because the Pope says priests aren't allowed to have kids. Um, But then we do have Monaco with just 6.6. Uh, Monaco is that's the, the famous place where we have the Formula One street circuit and the casinos. I call it Monaco. Some people call it Monaco. Um, yeah, I do have a, a funny accent when I pronounce some of these places. Saint Pierre has got seven point one. I don't know where this place was. I had to look it up on Google Maps, and it's an island off Newfoundland. Which if you don't know where Newfoundland is, it is a place off of Canada. Then we have Andorra with 7.5. This is a tiny principality between Spain and France where my friends in Barcelona tell me they like to go and do their shopping. Uh, then Japan. Japan is at 7.7. We, we know Japan pretty well. They were the bad guys in World War II, but they make anime and sushi. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, two, two sides to every coin. Uh, but then, you know, we've also got Puerto Rico. I, I found Puerto Rico quite an interesting one to be one of the lowest. 
then Slovenia, Taiwan, South Korea, Greece, Singapore. Um, I think I've gone over 10. But those are the, the, lowest, the lowest birth um, rate places in the world. If we have to come and look at the top 10, we'll see in first place, uh, there's a tie between Niger and Angola with 44.2. Um, I mean, a little interesting fact about Angola is that South Africa fought a war there against Cuba. So yeah, check that out on Wikipedia if, if, uh, if battles interest you. Um, then we have Mali with 43 uh, birth rates and Mali's famous for the University of Timbuktu. Uh, we then have Uganda, famous for exotic birds and the gorilla sanctuary. Zambia, it's got that beautiful waterfall called Victoria Falls. Um, then Burundi's in there. Uh, Burundi's one of the few African countries to be a direct territorial continuation of a pre-colonial um, era. Um, although it is considered to be the least happiest place in the world, according to a report done in 2018. And I want, I want to try to say nice things about Africa, but I mean, if we keep going down the list, we've got Burkina Faso, where I've just checked the news there, a South African person has been kidnapped and a blast has killed eight soldiers. Um, we then have Malawi. Malawi is a nice place. I think Malawi is like Africa's best kept secret. Uh, Lake Malawi is a paradise, so check that out if you enjoy um, adventure uh, holidays. Although I would recommend that you stay away from the next country, which is Somalia. It's very dangerous, home to the pirates and many terrorists, uh, which is unfortunate because Somalia does have some interesting caves to explore. And then finally on our list of the top 10 is Liberia with uh, 38.3 births uh, per thousand. And I mean, Liberia is going through a very interesting macroeconomic situation. Um, I mean, something weird's happened. There's, there's been like $100 million, which apparently equates to 5% of their GDP, uh, has been printed in Sweden and Lebanon, and they send the money to the country, but the container was lost. So everyone's like, where did all the money go? But, but as you can see, Africa, Africa is exciting. There's a lot happening here. And as you may have noticed, the top 10 highest birth rate countries are all African. In fact, the top 25, except for Af Afghanistan, are all African. And this is, this is where the stats start getting interesting. In 1919, 16% uh, of the world's birth were African. Now they say it's around 27%. It's predicted in 2050 that it might be 37%. And they might say like in 2060, we might be seeing more sub-Saharan African babies being born than the whole of Asia. So that's including China and India. Look, predictions are not normally uh, accurate as they take a pattern and they extrapolate it without taking all the factors into account. However, this is done by the United Nations, so one would hope that they did, did it properly. Um, I mean, and one factor that they are looking at is just, for instance, Nigeria, one of Africa's biggest countries, um, its fertility rate is more than double that of India. And this rate is not slowing down as much as in other parts of the world. So, is population growth a problem? Um, some people tend to think so, and, and not necessarily because we're going to run out of food and resources, but because they say that children are quite expensive and they keep families poor. Um, I went onto a website called Parent24, and it says that it costs 90,000 rand a year to raise a child in South Africa. So that's around $9,000. But then what they do is they say over 23 years, that's 20.7 million rand. And I get upset when I see these numbers because, I mean, come on, guys, you are, you are abusing the statistics. You're trying to get a little bit of sensationalism. Um, you can't take a straight line projection of, uh, you know, of an annuity happening across a year and add it all up because you've ignored the time value of money. Uh, so if actuaries were to take the present value of an annuity that has 23 annual payments of 90,000 Rand each, uh, with, say, a discount rate of 10%, then I think we get, I don't know, I want, I want you guys to check, check my maths. I get 800,000 Rand. I mean, 800,000 Rand versus 20 million, that is quite a big, 
being different. So I don't know if, if my HP 12C calculator is, is faulty. I haven't used it in a while. Maybe the batteries are flat. But just double check my maths because that is quite a big difference. Um, but I think, no, I think that just shows the power, the power of compound interest. Um, but yeah, I mean, 800,000 Rand, that is still, you know, from a present value point of view, that is still a lot. I mean, we're talking about 80,000 uh, US dollars. Um, which is insane when you see that the average South African um, family's uh, assets is only around 10,000 uh, US dollars. So children are like eight times the average family wealth. So that is, that is intense. And I mean, if we, even if we exclude this, we can show that children cause inequality. Um, and this is, this is just an example. It's a very, very simple il illustration. But let's say we have two families. We've got a rich family that's worth 10 million, and let's say we have a poor family that's worth 1 million rand. Uh, the rich family is 10 times richer than the poor family, you know, 10 to 1 million. But now let's say the rich family has one child and the poor family has four children. So let's ignore the cost of raising the child and let's just look at inheritance in the next generation. We'll see that the rich child gets 100% of the family wealth and now has 10 million rand. The poor children get 25% of the family wealth and each now has a quarter of a million. Now, the rich family is 40 times wealthier, but we've also increased the number of poor families to rich families. So we can see how, how having lots of children can cause inequality, and that is a big, big problem that we are seeing in, in Africa. Now, one solution is to tax the rich. And I mean, this sounds great in the short term. Take money from the people who have a lot of it and give it to the people who don't have a lot of it uh, right now. Um, but in the long term, what we tend to see is that the rich migrate. Uh, so they leave the country, they close their businesses down, so unemployment uh, increases. And instead of them paying, say, 20% tax, they're now paying nothing because they've left the country and gone somewhere else. So the government starts actually getting less tax um, overall. And then, of course, governments, when they see all the tax money, they, I mean, that temptation to take it, some of them find it too strong. And we do see governments stealing a lot of tax, tax money. So another solution um, is better access to, to contraceptives. Um, in the short term, this probably doesn't have the best effect like that, uh, taxing does. But in the long term, we do see good results. And this has been happening in Ethiopia, Malawi, and Rwanda. Their birth rates are coming down with the introduction of, of contraceptives. Of course, contraceptives are controversial uh, when you start introducing elements of culture and certain religions and, and things like that. Um, another solution, which is also not that attractive in the short term, but it's probably the best for the long term, is, is education. Now, African schools are, are awful. Many teachers don't show up and they aren't even educated themselves. But, and I hope if you're, if you're an African president and you're listening, this is where I want you to pay attention. But if Africa starts investing in internet infrastructure, we could see mass adoption of online learning as a solution to, to education. Look, Africa has around 2,000 languages, and I do think it's important to learn in your mother tongue. So we do need that, that AI that can help with translating and, and just make your education available to everybody in the language that they want. Um, another extreme idea, uh, maybe this belongs in the sci-fi books, is blockchain governance systems. You know, imagine a monetary system that works like Bitcoin where a predetermined chunk of the block reward goes to government. Another chunk could be distributed across the population as like a universal basic income. And I mean, if designed properly, so yeah, we'll, we'll probably need to get economists involved. Um, but if designed properly, this could give stability to Africa's financial markets, cause a wave of investments. Um, but why I say it's sci-fi is because it would require government to give up significant power. And I think government is, is Africa's biggest problem. So while education and blockchain could be solutions, the biggest problem, I would say, is Africa's government. Um, I mean, we just have to look at the mess of Nigeria's government at the moment with MTN. MTN is a company providing internet infrastructure. I mean, that's like, that's part of the solution. And the Nigerian government is smacking them with a massive fine. And it's just, it just makes people not want to do business in, in Africa. Um, and I mean, this, this is the thing is we're seeing poverty rates around the world are falling except 
in Africa. And, and this is where I think actuaries can get involved. We can help governments understand the data. We can show them correlations between birth rates and poverty. You know, we can help them with monetary policies. We can assist them with setting terms with foreign investors. And, and I mean, I'm being serious. I mean, you just need to see recently in the news, Tanzania's president has told women to throw away birth control because he wants more people. This is a country of over 50 million people where half of them live on less than $2 a day. And I mean, actuaries have helped governments in the past, specifically the South African government, which really stuffed up with regards to HIV and AIDS, which resulted in hundreds and thousands of unnecessary deaths. Fortunately, actuaries did start getting involved and they started assisting governments with mathematical models. And that's the thing, by studying actuarial science, you have the ability to save millions of lives and make a positive impact in this world. So let this be your motivation, because uh, I know you guys are busy writing the exams. I know they're difficult, but it's worth it. More actuaries, we can help this world, we can make it a better place. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this little podcast. Uh, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try release one, one a week. Um, so yeah, make sure you subscribe and let me know if, if you've got anything to say in the comment section below. I mean, it's always great having a discussion with you guys. But anyway, keep well. Cheers.